All right, good morning. Uh, first, I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Brian Thiers with the Bradenton Police Department, the PIO. Uh, I will be speaking first, giving you a summary of events that took place on April the 2nd. And then I will have Lieutenant Weldon come up for any questions you may have of him. And also Chief Bevan will be here for question if needed. On April, I'm sorry, April the 2nd, 2017, approximately 3.57 a.m., Bradenton Police Department Communications Center received a call from an alarm company advising they had a residential burglary alarm at 2405 9th Street West in Bradenton. The alarm company also advised communications that the it was a general burglary alarm, that the homeowner or key holder was on site, had given proper codes, and was still wishing to speak with the police. Lieutenant Weldon, a 15-year veteran of BPD, was in the area, heard the call for service, and understanding that it was just a simple alarm to a residence with a key holder on site, responded. Again, he arrived under the assumption that this was a call, a standard call of a homeowner who had tripped their alarm system. He was under the assumption it was a false alarm, and so he approached by himself. What he quickly learned was that the location was not a residence, but in fact a business. And as he approached, he saw that the front door had been smashed in. He hears rustling inside of the business, still under the assumption that this is the key holder inside, he enters. Upon entering the business, he immediately confronts a subject who is concealing his identity by using a t-shirt wrapped around his face and automatically recognizes this as what appears to be a burglary in progress. Lieutenant Weldon is able to radio for backup and draws his weapon and confronts the subject, ordering him to put his hands up. Initially, the suspect complies and puts his hands up, and Lieutenant Weldon reholsters his firearm and grabs the suspect by the hand in an attempt to place him in custody. The suspect at that point begins to violently resist Lieutenant Weldon. Lieutenant Weldon and the suspect engage in a confrontation that lasts for over a minute and a half. During the confrontation, the suspect grabs for Lieutenant's firearm at least two times. Also during the confrontation, the suspect uses his hands to gouge and scratch at Lieutenant Weldon's face. He also gouges at his eyes, as you see in the video. This violent encounter again lasts for over a minute and a half. Lieutenant Weldon was able to radio to communications two more times to let him know that he needed help before his radio was pulled off of his shirt. And as you see in the video, is dangling below him. Uh, Lieutenant Weldon is able at one point to push the subject away and back up, draws his weapon again, points it at the suspect, ordering him to stop and the suspect continues to walk towards him. Lieutenant Weldon is in fear for his life. The suspect continues to approach him. Lieutenant Weldon's eyes are blurry. He's having a hard time seeing. So as you watch in the video, he uses his hands as the suspect approaches. And as he gets close enough, he strikes him with his weapon and the suspect falls to the ground. At that moment, backup officers come into the scene and take the suspect into custody. What you also see in the video is as they're arresting the suspect, Lieutenant Weldon puts his head down on the counter because he's tired and he's in pain. The suspect, Isaac O'Toneal Hernandez Dubon, is a 23-year-old Honduran citizen in the United States illegally. At this time, we are unsure how long he's been here. He has no prior criminal record that we are aware of in the United States at this time. He is a suspect or a person of interest in several other burglaries in that area. At this time, I'd like to bring up Lieutenant William Weldon.
Good afternoon, everyone. We're, uh, he's not really going to make a statement. Um, I just want to preface this by saying he's been through a lot. He's had a few days off uh, to reflect on what happened, to spend some time with his family. Uh, this was a very significant experience in his life. Um, it was a fight for his life, actually. And uh, in this particular instance, he prevailed, and everybody went home, which is always our ultimate goal. Uh, but if you have some questions, you'd like to have him review the video for you or walk through anything, now's the, the time to do it. Okay? How are you feeling this morning? I'm feeling fine, thank you. What was going on through your head when you quickly realized that you were walking into something that was completely different than what you expected? Well, it's something out of the ordinary because I normally wouldn't walk into a burglary in progress by myself, uh, but I knew I'd already uh, shown myself and it was a moment that I had to react before backup got there. Did it seem, what were those moments like when you thought that everything was under control and then the suspect just lunged at you? It was a surprise, um, but he wouldn't comply, but I could see that he didn't have anything in his hand, so he was unarmed at, at the moment that I saw. So I wasn't going to fire on an unarmed man. So I put my hand or a weapon away and attempted to take him into custody. But that didn't work. No, it didn't. Tell us about those moments after. During the struggle? Okay. Yeah. Ah, I was afraid for my life. Uh, I didn't know what to expect from him. All I knew is I needed to keep control of him until my backup officers got there. What was going through your head I couldn't see. I was in pain and I was tired. So I was just trying to recompose myself. When he was trying to gouge your eyes, I guess, was, he, was his fingernails actually hitting your eyes? Or, or? His fingers were going into my eye sockets. What went through your head when that was happening? What? I'm sorry? What went through your head when that was happening? To get his fingers out of my eyes. And Did he say anything to you? Was there any conversation? There was no conversation. I don't know if he could speak English. I don't know. I don't know if he understood English, but there was no conversation between the two of us. What in your head kept you going? I know it only lasted a minute, but it had to seem like a lot longer for you. Well, I needed to make sure that I walked out of there safely and he didn't get away. A lot of other officers with their life in danger might have pulled their weapon and shot at the suspect. Why didn't you? Well, I did pull my weapon um, there at the end. I re-pulled it at the end, and I feel that I would have been justified in shooting him, but deadly force is to be used as a last resort, and I had one other resort that I could use, and I used it. If that resort didn't work, then there's a chance that I would have used lethal force. When you watch the video, which I assume you have since then, just seeing your actions, seeing everything that happened, that could have ended a whole lot worse. But It could have, but I'm blessed it didn't. How did your training help you? Kept me alive. I mean, that's bottom line, it kept me alive. My training kept me alive. And when you went back home and kind of reflected on the, the day you had, what were you feeling and thinking? I had a lot of mixed emotions. Uh, go, you go through your head, wonder if there was anything else that you could have done to uh, have prevented the, the entire incident. But my main goal was to be with my family and comfort my wife, because this affected her just as much as it affected me. How does this change your, your when you go back on the road, when you're back on the street, being a police officer? Does it did it change you in any way? I'm sure it does, but right at this moment, I don't see what changes could be, but I'm sure in the back of your mind, it's always gonna change something. How did you feel that both you and the suspect were able to walk away alive and injured, but alive? That's the way it should have ended up. I mean, I 
we don't come to work thinking we're going to have to shoot some or th we want to shoot somebody. So anytime that you can get it, even if you get into a fight like this and you walk away, both people walk away, then it's always a good day. Do you think you would approach uh, a suspected burglary different from now on with going into this? I mean, do you think that... Well, this didn't come out as a suspected burglary. It came out as a possibly a false alarm because the key holder was supposedly on site and she gave the proper passcode. So I'm approaching as I'm going there to talk to the homeowner or business owner just to get her side of what it was going on. So I did not even realize it was a burglary until I looked in and shown the flashlight and seen the burglary suspect. Was that the most scared you've ever been in your career in law enforcement? Probably. Was it one of those life flash before your eyes kind of things? No. I, I don't know. I've never had one of them, so I wouldn't know. Uh, but I don't see it as a life flashing before my eyes. I just seen that, uh, felt that my life was in danger and I need to do whatever I could do to, to get out of it alive. Was he hiding? How did the store owner not know he was in there? Because the store owner wasn't there. Oh. When I walked in, this is where he was at when he walked in, in that exact position right there. And I come in the front door. In fact, you can see my flashlight. It looked like my flashlight right there. And when he came in, that's where I saw him. And so, and when I saw him, he saw me, and he got up and was coming around the counter, and I had no choice but to react. When he attacked your eyes, talk about how difficult was it to fight back? Were you blinded? Talk about that. Oh, yeah, I was blinded, but it's one of them things that, you do what you got to do to to get out of it. Now you you were going in expecting to be speaking to the store owner. Was there a miscommunication with the security company with dispatch? Where what where was the miscommunication? That the store I can comment on that. When you're done. Yeah, I'll that's I don't know where the miscommunication was, but it's being looked into. I'll stay right here. Um, Lieutenant Weldon's a little out of his element here. We asked him to to come in today, but I'll tell you that he's being conservative in his comments to you. One of the things that has stuck with me um, is my conversation with him the next day. And, and uh, he told me in his southern draw, he says, ma'am, the thing I'm most uh, grateful for is that it was me that walked in the door and not one of the officers under my command. And that's really stuck with me because those are the people who we want to be leaders in, in our agencies. And I said, well, why do you say that? He said, because I was a Marine, I'm a veteran, I've trained, I've kept myself in shape, and I knew I could handle this. And my fear is, is that not everybody could have handled it the way I did. And I want, I want you all to know that, because that speaks to his character. Um, I will tell you, and even Lieutenant Thiers can maybe provide some follow-up, the first thing we did on Monday morning is make contact with the alarm company and have them launch an investigation into how this could happen because errors on their part almost resulted in a catastrophic event here in the city of Rainton. And uh, we don't take that lightly, and we are going to hold them responsible for that. This ended good enough, but it could have ended terribly. Um, you know, Lieutenant Weldon, I'm going to reiterate, was in a fight for his life. You had a subject trying to gouge out his eyes and take his firearm. And it really doesn't get any worse than that. He handled himself in a very exemplary manner and did everything he could. Um, at the very end, like he said, um, he said he had two options. He knew he could try to take one last swing and uh, strike the subject with his gun. And that's something, by the way, that's against policy, OK? Um, or he could shoot him. And I thank God that he went ahead and did that last act before we had ourselves a more unfortunate set of circumstances. So again, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that he really did a, a fine job, and I'm incredibly proud of him as a police officer and as a leader in this agency. It so. may have been against policy, but in, in this circumstance, yeah. <laughs> there won't be an internal affairs investigation, right. if that's right, what right, you're right, asking. Right. Um, it's just something that we obviously attempt to uh, 
tell officers, you know, that's not really in your use of force matrix. Um, when it comes down to a situation like this, you do anything and everything you need to do, okay, to save your life, and he did that. How do you fall on, you know, do you, um, certainly, um, you know, like you said, it's, it seems good for both parties that people are able to walk away from the situation, but um, in use of force generally, as far as use of deadly force, you know, do you tell your officers, you know, that they have to look at situations like this as things that could happen, you know, and how do you, how do you fall on that issue? We, we train, we train for protecting ourselves, protect, protecting our community, but we train in de-escalation. Um, we do everything we can to avoid the use of deadly force, but unfortunately, sometimes that's reality. Uh, and you're never gonna hear me second guessing anybody else across the nation who's had to engage in that because as you can see in this video um, it's uh, the slightest hand movement it's things that you may or may not even have seen I'm not sure if you guys could really clearly see what was happening to him um, until he spoke to you today and said his fingers were actually inside his eye sockets you wouldn't understand the gravity of what was happening to a site Lieutenant Weldon shared with me that as the suspect approached him for the final time, he saw four of them in front of him. He had no idea where the suspect was. That's why you see him put his hand out, and that's why you saw him take such a wide swing. He had no idea where contact would be made because he didn't even have a sight picture. So. Chief, how does this make you feel about the training at your department that both <coughs> the suspect and the officer were able to walk away alive? I, uh, as, again, I'll say that every set of circumstances speak for themselves. I think we do a great job of training our officers here, but we'll never have enough training. Every day we arrive to work, it's training in progress. It's keeping ourselves prepared, uh, adept, all those things that contributes to successful outcomes such as this. And, and you bring up a good point. Um, you know, these are situations where you think you're going into one thing, and in a flash, it changes into something else. And this is what our officers get faced with each and every day, each and every moment. This is what consumes their days. Now, they may think uh, they're hand, heading into a domestic situation. They arrive on scene and, and people are armed. Um, this is just a, a good example that really is receiving some attention because it's on video. But make no mistake about it, these types of situations happen each and every day, and officers all across the nation are faced with similar sets of circumstances each and every day. Has the state attorney's office reached out to Customs Border Patrol or ICE um, in regards to the suspect? We've been contacted by Border Patrol, and they did advise us that there has been a hold placed on the suspect. That's it. Knowing that he's here in the United States illegally, does that just add more frustration to you that could have been prevented a lot sooner, all of this? We're, uh, we're not here to really look at the big picture um, when it comes to that. We're here looking at the safety of our communities and, and the safety of our officers and um, whether he should have been here or shouldn't have been there. What I'm glad is that he's off the street now. Um, and my hope is that he's not going to be back out there to harm anybody else. Chief, were there other businesses that he, that this suspect hit recently? I, I think Lieutenant Thiers can comment on that, but he is a uh, person of interest in some other crimes within the area. In that same, right then, that same vicinity? I think in the general vicinity, right. yes. Do you mind if we play the video while? Yeah, yes, I'm, I'm going to hand it back over to him. Yeah, okay. Walk us through that. Yeah, you want to pass by? Maybe stand at the microphones and then, unless you want to point. I'd like to note that the audio you're hearing is not from the scene. That's me coming in the door right there and confronting him right there. He's got his telephone in his hand and he appears to be texting or trying to call somebody. I didn't know if he was calling somebody from the outside to come in and help him and he wouldn't drop it. And so I knocked it out of his hands. He appeared to be complying. So I put my flashlight up on the counter and reholstered my gun and went to take him into custody. And this is what ensued. Right there, you see in that bottom left is where he just went after my gun.
And you can see he's trying to get at my head right there. That's him putting his, the top left is gouging my right eye right there. And that was the final blow. Did you call for backup at any point, or are they just on the way? No, I had called for backup. Okay. Yeah, I called for backup while we were struggling. But that's pretty much the video right there. How's your recovery going with the It's going fine. The swellings went down. Um, got antibiotic drops I'm putting in my eyes to, to take care of the bleeding, but they're fine. So you can see perfectly now? I, spike's perfect. And seeing that again? It's disturbing. When you look at a day or two later and you're looking at this, what do you, what's your thought process as you see what he was doing to you and how this just... You know, it's easy to sit back and look at a video and see, well, I could have done this, I could have done that. But in the heat of the moment, you've got milliseconds to make decisions, and you make the best decision you can at the moment during the, during the process. And I felt that I made the best decisions that I could. And, and you would, to get him away, you swing your arm? I mean, explain what the heck, it looks like you had your gun in your hand. When I pushed away, well, I pushed him away, I pushed myself away from him, and yes, I did draw my gun, but I could not, I was seeing multiple images of him, so I didn't know exactly where he was at, so you see me waving my hand back and forth. I actually hit him right here and somewhere around in the throat, the chest area, so I knew about where his head was, and that's when I took the swing. And you struck him? I struck him. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, just to cap a couple of things, the suspect and both Lieutenant Weldon were transported to the hospital that evening. Uh, the suspect received uh, a couple of stitches um, on his face. Lieutenant Weldon uh, was treated and released that evening, went home to rest with his wife. He's been following up with an optometrist uh, to make sure that his eyesight returns completely to normal. Um, again, the suspect is on hold at the Manatee County Jail. Well, the the um, we're not dealing with that side of it. We're only worried about the case that you see and the other cases that are pending, the, the other cases we're looking into. Detectives are looking at video from surrounding locations. Uh, we're doing fingerprint comparisons. So that hopefully will lead to uh, either closure of more cases or, or more charges for uh, Mr. Debon. Can you tell us more about those other cases? How many? Were they homes or businesses? Um, at this time, I'll, uh, it's it's definitely one other business, and the other one I'm not 100% sure on. Again, we've sent some forensic evidence over to the county to help us with that, uh, and we're just waiting on some fingerprint evidence to come back at this time. Any idea when the lieutenant will be back on duty? Um, when he's good and rested, when when he feels ready, we're we're going to work with him. Uh, his his squad's stepping up to take care of him. Uh, this agency's uh, taking care of him. We're going to do everything in our power to make sure that he's 100% ready to return uh, before he goes back out there. And Lieutenant, do you know no, no how long? to that, though? No. He tried to come back the next day. He, he won't, yeah. He tried to come back the next day. He tried to report for duty the next day. What was the age difference of <laughs> the suspect and him? Oh. I 
I mean, he was fighting with a younger man. Very much so. Yeah. Tim, do you know what, how long the uh, suspect had been in the U.S.? Really? We do not know that at this time. No, that's something we're we're trying to figure out, trying to pinpoint some some timelines. So. Has he had any type of court appearance or? Uh, he did go to first appearance yesterday or uh, Monday. He went on Monday morning. Thank you. Um, his bond was set, and then that afternoon, uh, the federal government went and placed the hold. So, nothing that we can find at this time. Again, um, resources are going beyond our our reach to, to determine that. So, any other questions? Okay. Thank you all very, very much.